Good evening, and welcome to Northshire Bookstore. I'm David Wood, the events manager here. And at any time this evening, please feel free to type any question you have for our author in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. I'll save them up for you and pose them when we get towards the end of tonight's event. It is my great pleasure to welcome Ari Ravenhoft, the author of The Fighting Soul on the Road with Bernie Sanders, which you can order from Northshire at the link in the chat. Ari Ravenhoft is a photographer, an author, and veteran of numerous political campaigns and organizations. He served as deputy campaign manager on Senator Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign and was a Sanders aide from 2017 to 2021. Prior to working for Senator Sanders, he was the host of The Agenda, a daily national radio show on Sirius XM, and served as an advisor to Senate Democratic leader Harry Reid, John Kerry, and former Vice President Al Gore, among others. His writing has appeared in The New Republic, Jacobin Magazine, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. His new book, the Fighting Soul on the Road with Bernie Sanders has been called a rollicking campaign memoir and an authoritative description of the candidate's personality. While Maureen Dowd in the Times says, the former advisor offers an intimate portrait of his cranky boss, writing about everything from Sanders' famous mittens, to his love of picket lines and Motown songs, to his distaste for the inane droning of cable news commenters, to his prescient fear that Trump was nuts and would upend democracy. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire, Ari Rabenhoft. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for coming out tonight online. Um, I wrote this book because Bernie Sanders, I, I had this privileged moment in history where I got to spend basically three and a half years every day alongside somebody I view as one of the most significant historical figures of the 21st century, somebody who has had more influence on US politics, I believe, than nearly any person who has run for president and lost. He's up there, I think, going back in history with William Jennings Bryant, with uh, Theodore Roosevelt from 1912, with Barry Goldwater in 1964 and his influence on the Republican Party, obviously not policy-wise with Barry Goldwater. Um, and I think what he did the main thing that Bernie has done, I think, is show a generation of activists and Democrats that a better world is possible, that we don't have to constrain our beliefs, that Democrats have been told for basically uh, when Bernie ran for the first time in 2015, they had basically been told for um, 35 years kind of since 1980, that you can't have the things you want, you can't build the country you want, that building that country is dangerous. And there is still a portion of the Democratic Party that very much believes that, that believes that we have to sublimate our values to Republicans, that they can kind of campaign on their most extreme rhetoric, which I think a lot of us find dangerous and um, not just antithetical to progress, but actually physically dangerous to many different portions of our society. And we can't campaign on things that would protect people like universal health care. And we can't say that government perhaps should serve the needs of the people over the needs of um, financial institutions. We exist and that doesn't mean he's won. I think people said, well, you know, the Democratic Party still has the Joe Manchins in it. And that's that's true. We we haven't totally won. And in a lot of ways, you won't, we won't win until we elect somebody with the ideology of Bernie Sanders president. But what Bernie did in that moment in, in 2016 and then 2020 was show the a uh, hope for the future and i think we are in a moment now that i wish democrats would learn more from bernie and what do i mean i mean joe biden is at really low approval ratings uh we're going into a midterms where democrats are at risk in the house and senate and a lot of that is is government is i believe is government is not meeting the material needs of its people, that people, and this serves and this plays into a conservative ideology, because if government can't meet, meet the material needs of its people, 
then what point does government has at which point conservatism and its idea that government shouldn't do anything except fund the military becomes a rational uh, a rational belief. Um, I think the mistake that we have made is is thinking that government is powerless. I look at uh, not to be critical of another candidate running for president, but I look at, for example, the transportation department and Mayor Pete, and I guess Secretary Pete now, and I see a department that has innumerable and enormous power over so many aspects of our um, of our economy. And to 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 take a small aspect, I'll give you one that just it, it's something. It's not a material thing that affects a lot of people, but it is something that directly annoys people, and that's air travel, right? The transportation department has an enormous amount of regulatory authority over the airlines. Um, they have an enormous amount of power to tell airlines to stop behaving the way they are. They have an enormous amount of power for punishing airlines for, I'm going to say, somewhat of a fraud they're committing, for example, by booking flights that they have no intention or capacity to fly, uh, and then having people get canceled. And in a society where people fly for necessity, in addition to vacation, but people fly to funerals and weddings and that kind of stuff, having a flight canceled is a major ordeal. Or in a society where we don't have days off, for example, uh, where we have limited days off, I should say, getting one day of your vacation messed up because the airline canceled the flight is a major ordeal for people in the transportation department. We have this idea, oh, you know, it happens, we can do it. But frankly, the transportation department could do a lot to force airlines to, to change behavior. The and, and then on a more serious note, we have, we've had shipping problems in this country and port problems that have led to higher costs for consumers. The transportation department could do a lot. Um, the federal government could, and I imagine um, a Bernie Sanders administration would be a lot more active at taking, using the power of the federal government that Democrats have just been scared of, non-legislative power, but power that has existed over the years to, to push, um, frankly, corporations to behave better. I'll give, a, I'll give another example. There is enormous power in the Department of Health and Human Services. Absolutely enormous to control the price of prescription drugs. Uh, huge and almost unstoppable power. And what I mean by that is, I'll give you an example. It is federal law that the HHS secretary can allow importation of drugs from Canada as long as, they're, as, long as they certify that it's, it's safe. This would have an impact of lowering drug prices for Americans. That's already in law. It passed. Bernie fought for it. It passed in the late 90s when he was a House member. Um, that's just one example with the sign of a pen saying we can import drugs across the border at, uh, on a commercial basis, not on the personal basis, because on a personal basis you're allowed to, but on a commercial basis, we could lower drug prices. And, and of course, there are things that uh, have legislative needs. And of course, we would rather have a Cong uh, Senate without two Democrats who want to block change. But the point is, we exist in a world, the world that, that we exist in and the world that's changing is people expect more from government. And I think Bernie helped create that. And, and frankly, we're in a moment where the current administration, by doing more, could show that government can do things. It's, you know, it's, it's the argument for canceling student debt. One of the arguments is, if you can't do anything else, this is the first step that the federal government has the power to do. And what did I think Bernie brought to that conversation? I think so many of those conversations, the student debt one, certainly would never have been happening if Bernie Sanders had not run for president. The book itself, I, I want to say, is... Um, is it was really personal. I've written, this is the third full book I've written. Um, one was on the history of Fox News. One was on how, um, li how lies are actually 
created within the political system. That one's called Lies Incorporated. I actually published it before Trump was elected president. It was kind of predictive of where we are now. And I'm actually very proud of that book. Uh, but this book was very personal. Um, this book, I really wanted to take people into a world of a political campaign. I really wanted to show you what it was like to travel with a campaign for three, three and a half years. I wanted to show you what it's like to be in that position. I wanted to show people what, um, who Bernie Sanders is behind the scenes, what he is like on a campaign, how, how he makes decisions, how he thinks about the world, how he, how he exists within the political ecosystem. And I, I hope, and I think the reviews have been very clear on this, that it was a, it's an easy book to read. It's, I wanted to make it fun. I wanted to tell stories that really capture moments that people don't get to see. For me, there are kind of two bookend moments in the, uh, that really define the campaign. The first moment, and, and they're not the end in the beginning, but they do kind of, for me, really define a lot of the campaign. The first moment happened in Detroit before the, uh, the debate in July. And we were in the green room and it was me, the campaign manager, Faz Shakir and Bernie Sanders. And we were sitting in the, in the green room, just the three of us. And he, Bernie was kind of, he looked a little bit down. He looked a little bit low energy. And uh, John Delaney, who was, uh, many forget was running for president, but was running for president, who was a congressman from Maryland, who made money in the healthcare industry, released a statement saying, I'm going to basically call Bernie a communist on stage. And, talk about why his universal health care plans are bad for the Democratic Party. And Jeff Weaver, who had been around Bernie for decades in Vermont and ran his 2016 campaign, texted Faz and I and said, read him the statement. That'll perk him up. We were kind of like, really? We should read him this like really negative statement? They're like, yeah. He's like, yeah, read him the statement. So we read him, Faz read the statement, and Bernie turned and said, do you know what my favorite song was as, a, uh, as, a, as growing up? It was the Charlie Brown song. Why is everybody always picking on me? And the famous song by the Coasters. And Faz brought it up onto his phone and started playing it. And Bernie started dancing around the green room, shadow boxing. And just that moment, that memory, that, that music brought him back to his childhood. And he came out on stage that night. And I think that was probably his best debate performance of the campaign. And then uh, just another moment, the last day of campaigning before the world shut down for COVID, March 10th, we were in Detroit and we didn't know what to do. And we were in this moment where we had a few hours because we spoke, we were supposed to go to Ohio for the Super Tuesday. It wasn't Super, sorry, the week after Super Tuesday election night rally in Ohio. And rumors were, we were hearing that Ohio was going to shut down and they weren't gonna have events anymore. And we were waiting kind of for word on what we were gonna do. We were talking to health officials and we, um, we, were, we were in Detroit and Bernie said, hey, let's go to the Henry Ford Museum. So we went to the Henry Ford Museum because we had this weird three hour period where we had nothing, which was unusual in the campaign. And we toured the museum, we looked at the historic artifacts, which are incredible up there. And then we had another hour and Bernie was like, let's go to the Motown Museum. So the Motown Museum is located in downtown Detroit. It's in the Motown offices, the original ones. So we took a tour of the museum and Bernie was going through and he knew all the history, he knew all the albums. He was talking about each one. And the kind of final room of the tour is the original Motown recording studio. And in the studio, Bernie and the tour guide just started duetting on My Girl. Um, and it was, a, it, was, it was a kind of a moment that ended the campaign. And I have a, a picture in my book that I took of that moment of Bernie in the Motown recording studio singing with the tour guide um, on kind of this day that the world was coming to a to a close on in, 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 in what I recognized is that studio 
was one of the most meaningful places in Bernie's history. That that studio created so many of the memories of his childhood. And it was a day after Jesse Jackson had endorsed Bernie, which I think was a hugely meaningful moment for him. Um, it was one where he, you know, Jesse had endorsed him in his campaign after Bernie had endorsed Jesse Jackson in 88. It was kind of that coming full circle. And I really, I wanted to share, I shared that scene and kind of the behind the scenes in the book. And that those are the moments I really wanted to bring people into. And I'm happy to take any questions people have. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Let me just check that right now. Um, so uh, until then, Ari, let me ask you a question. What, where, where do we go now? I mean, everything seems bad. Um, so where do we get that Bernie energy, that, that hope? Um, look, I think everything might seem bad, but we are in, you know, we are, we are always going to be fighting for uh, change. And, you know, it is, things are bad. Things are not good in this country. We're in the midst of another economic crisis. We are in the midst of a uh, kind of inf uh, inflation where people are paying more. We did not, people did not get the wage and income growth that, that billionaires got during the pandemic. But it's, it's a moment to fight. And I'm reminded, and I tell the story in the book, of something that a conservative activist, Grover Norquist, said to me once. I asked who, who spent his life uh, advocating for tax cuts. And I asked him, how much tax cuts are enough? Like, when do you say you've just won? Like, you've won a lot. So when, when are you going to say you just won? And he looked at me and he said, more. Meaning that the fight's never over. So good place or bad place, I think Bernie would say we have to keep fighting and it doesn't, we can be in either place, but we're, you know, the, there isn't gonna be a moment where we say the world is perfect. So it's not like, you know, the world could be worse. Donald Trump could have won re-election, not, um, there, could, there could be, um, you know, it's, a lot of catastrophic things are going on, so I don't want to minimize it, but we would have to fight regardless would be my answer. So we just keep fighting. I knew uh, of Bernie Sanders long before I became a, a Vermonter in 2016. and was delighted when he, uh, when he announced his first bid. Can you talk a little bit about how he you know, moved from sort of relative obscurity to just being such a firebrand for us right now? Sure, I think, I think in the book I address this, but it is a very, it's almost uncomfortable for him. The idea that he's gone from, you know, even though he was mayor and a house member and a senator, he was at, at, you know, a cult hero, meaning he had a following across the country, but it was kind of, he wasn't like, certainly wasn't what he is now. Now there's um, on the campaign, one of the things we had was uh, pins that were the outline of Bernie's um, head with the glasses and a little, a, little, a little stone in the glass. And it's how we could identify staff uh, that could access uh, anywhere during an event. It was kind of an all access pin. And we, it was, it's just the outline of his head, nothing else. And what's amazing is you wear that pin every, anywhere everyone knows it's Bernie, just the outline of his head, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and to be that, and he'd hate this description, but famous, you know, is something that I think he thought was nuts. And he, he, said, to, he said to me on numerous occasions, hey, if my father and mother heard I was a senator, much less a viable candidate for president, they would think I was crazy coming from where I came from. And I think you have to think this is somebody who lived seven decades of their life, of their life as you know somebody who was known but not famous, and then to suddenly become famous as a septuagenarian is is a very strange and and somewhat difficult thing. I think he'd sometimes lament that he could no longer be a private person. That anywhere he went, 
if we were in an airport, people are stopping him for selfies. If we're in a restaurant, people are taking pictures. If he's on a plane and, you know, if he's on a plane and the airline, because he flies a billion times a year because he's doing events, he has to travel back and forth to Senate. So, you know, he has frequent flyer status up the wazoo. Uh, when the planes put him in, in, a, in a first class seat because of his frequent flyer status, you know, there's going to be a picture and it's going to be in the New York Post. That stuff, I, I think there's some level of, of like kind of strangeness and, and almost like the word isn't regret, but it, it's not easy. But on the other side, what he sees in that is because of that uh, notoriety, he has the ability to advocate for causes in labor, in other places, and make real material differences in people's lives that he wouldn't without that. That when he speaks, he, he at one, and one end will lament that, you know, in 2014, if he said something off, nobody would pay attention. Whereas now, if he says something off, it's in every major paper. I think he also sees that when he pushes his agenda, that it's a useful tool to really elevate his politics and his thinking in, in, a, media, in a media platform that it's never had before. And I think he sees the benefit in that. You can really see the sea change that sort of followed him. Uh, there's a question here from Theo. She says, what do you, or they, he says, what do you think about the effort of the People's Party, an attempt to make a major new party that doesn't take corporate money inspired by Bernie's campaign? Don't you think we need a third party for the Bernie movement to find fulfillment? And didn't the DNC show us that they don't play fair? Um, I'll take that question, like I'll do it in reverse. I think politics has never been fair to outsiders, so yes. Um, no doubt, and are never going to be fair to a candidate like Bernie. What history has shown is those candidates have to do the extra and overcome that unfairness. I do think, I do think uh, America needs some form of, I think we would benefit, especially at the local and congressional level at first, from some level of organized third party or systematic um, change outside the Democratic Party. I, I, I frankly, I don't actually know much about, I'm gonna be honest, I don't know much about the People's Party, but one thing I've seen in constant third party movements is they base themselves around, a, a critique I would have is they base themselves around running for president. Um, I think the problem with the presidential system is the president as an office, our constitution, to be frank, and the current setup of the legislature in many ways, the electoral, the, I should say the setup of the electoral process and the electoral college and the House of Representatives role in the third party in, um, in the presidential electoral system does rig, um, the presidential electoral process very much in favor of two parties. And in this case right now, very much would, because the way it works is you have to get half the electoral college vote to win the presidency, regardless of how many people won, you need 270 electors to win, right? And therefore, if you don't have that, it goes into the House of Representatives. Because of the way the House of Representatives votes for president, if the election goes into the House of Representatives because the Electoral College doesn't come to an end, the way it works is every state gets one vote. So frankly, like right now, Peter Welsh would get one vote and the entire California delegation would get one vote, which would make Peter Welsh a very powerful guy at that moment, unless he joins the Senate and then he gives up that power, which I guess, you know, he's running for Senate. So, so there is you know, he is giving, he is sacrificing that power right now to run for Senate. But the point is, if you just add up those states, the way the balance is in this country, because of all the small states um, that are Republican, the most small states aren't like Vermont, they're much more Republican. And therefore, um, if you look at the congressional delegation balance, even now with a House majority, you would have an easy Republican win in the House of Representatives. Uh, if a third party, so let's say, you know, a third party captured, you know, 
if you had three three viable parties and each one captured um, equal numbers, you would toss it into the House of Representatives. If 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 the third party captured, you know, two hundred and sixty electoral votes and beat the other two parties, you would still toss it into the House of Representatives, and Republicans would obviously elect their person president of the United States. That's just that that is a simple electoral reality. I do think. It is interesting to me to look at like, to look at Brazil, for example, where the presidential system, they don't have an electoral college system. They do a top two, they do a two round for the presidency, meaning, you know, there will be 16 candidates in the first round. Lula and Bolsonaro will likely be the two candidates out of the first round this October. And then Lula and Bolsonaro will face off. But in their Congress, there are, I think, eight or nine parties. I might have the number off, but eight or nine parties have seats and they form coalitions to control Congress. And I think if I were thinking, I think it would be very good, especially in the House of Representatives, which is kind of almost perfectly constructed for this, where a third where third party people won seats caucus separately from Democrats and Republicans. And in a case where they their votes would be required to for the speaker, a small number of independents who caucus together could take a large amount of authority. Right? Because you need half you need half the um Congress 200 and 18 votes to elect to elect the speaker. So if they needed 20 votes from independents, that would be powerful. And I think there were a series of activists who suggested that um, in the beginning of this Congress to force Nancy Pelosi to uh, get a vote on Medicare for all. And I, I do think it, it is a viable question in the House of Representatives. Could you elect organized third parties into that role. And I think, look, I do think there are advantages and disadvantages to a two-party system. And I think the problem right now is a lot of Americans just don't feel represented by either party. And I think, and feel, feel unrepresented in a variety of ways, meaning there are progressives who feel very unrepresented by Democrats recently. There are conservatives who feel unrepresented by Republicans, probably more unreasonably. There are people who just feel elected representatives don't serve their interests, right? Are serving the interests of the wealthy and the powerful and not them. And I think they would be looking for something else. And if I, I, I do actually think that, that a third party movement is something you know, it is something that could be viable in the right case. I just believe it is much more of a, if I, I do actually think the House of Representatives is the most susceptible institution to actual third party power. Because think about it this way, if you were to elect 10, in just 10 districts, independent members of Congress right now, you would have been the controlling votes in the House of Representatives for these two years, meaning you could have demanded anything you wanted from the speaker. Um, to some degree, I think there'd be, you know, you still need 218 people with you, you'd need votes for it, but you would have an incredible amount of political power in the formation of Congress. It's, it's kind of like um, if you look at the Knesset in Israel, which just dissolved, but if you look at the Knesset in Israel, you know, uh, a minor party leader who controls kind of a smaller block became prime minister because they basically had the, could, could assemble the coalition and become the swing. Um, and I think the House of Representatives, if very much opens itself up to that. But I, yeah, I do think with third parties, I think there is a reasonable case that a lot of this country feels unrepresented. And look, I think one of the problems I have, let me state this, one of the problems I have with certain democratic campaigners 
is that they presume that people owe them their vote. They presume that people, um, they presume that people are, uh, if you have a certain ideology, if you're anywhere to the left of center, you owe the Democratic Party your vote. Um, and I think the problem with that is it's not a compelling argument for people to vote. Like berating people, uh, mocking people, insulting people, not, not, not giving them ways that your election is going to benefit them is a, is a real, um, is not how you win over people. And I think the, the fact is, I think both parties in a lot of ways have, don't make the case to their constituents and the people within their party for, for what their party wants to stand for. I think, you know, the Democratic Party is a lot more about meeting people's material needs than Democratic elected officials are. And I, frankly, I think that leaves open a huge opening for people to campaign against. And this is for somebody who's generally been a Democrat my entire life. And I look, I live in Washington, DC, so my vote in Congress really doesn't count at all. And the only vote that we just had our primary for mayor, and that's literally the only vote that the Democratic primary for mayor is literally the only vote and city council are the only two votes that I cast that really matter for anything material because a Democrat wins in DC with like 80% of the vote for our electoral votes. And, you know, our mayor's race is the only, and city council are the only races where there's like a viable difference in the Democratic primary. Um, and you have to be a Democrat to vote in the Democratic primary in DC, I believe. So, you know, there's that. But if I were thinking about like broader congressional districts, yeah, I think there's an opening. I think there's viability. I think I think if I were third parties and I existed out in the world, I would I would think about that because I do think there is an argument that both parties haven't been meeting their needs. And look, the argument on the other side is the Republican Party is a horrendously fascist institution at the, or becoming a fascist institution that just today they're, you know, the Supreme Court, which is a political institution, um, undid a huge number of gun laws in this country. We, they're about to undo uh, abortion laws, that there are, there are costs to losing elections. There are costs to, to these things. And I think, and I think those things have to be, those things have to be weighed. There is a danger to a Donald Trump presidency. And I think, do I think, you know, this leads to the question, I think what the person wanted to ask, and I'm not going to put words in their mouth, was it right for Bernie to, to run as a Democrat? In the end, yes, because I don't believe there was any other, vi I don't believe other paths to the presidency were viable. Um, I've got a question, uh, and that combines both your, your Fox News book and this one about Bernie. What is the, the rationale, and do we have hope from his appearance, the recent appearance on Fox, the debate with Graham? Um, look, I think Bernie's rationale, we, we, did it, we did the Fox News town hall during the campaign, and Bernie's rationale is we have to show, we can talk, I have to show, and we have to show that we can go anywhere, bring our agenda anywhere, and show it successful. And as somebody who makes no bones about kind of going after Fox for what they became, really identified it as such well before it was kind of the institution it is. As somebody who oddly has known Tucker for, uh, what is it, probably like eight, 16 years now. I, I met Tucker 16 years ago. I haven't spoken to him in. I haven't had any contact with him in years, but I knew him at GW back in the day. I actually took a class with him, um, with Tucker Carlson at GW. Um, I, uh, when he was hosting Crossfire on CNN, actually, and I can, there are stories about that, but I can leave those to another book. Um, I feel like Fox News is a horrendous institution. Fox News um, 
the you know Fox News has done more damage in terms of spreading misinformation, mainstreaming bigotry, um, supporting right wing social movements, and generally spreading lies. And we should not be scared to call that out. At the same time, it would be it is it is malpractice to leave out a huge audience of people who you can talk to. And I think Bernie's take is he's going to go places and he's never going to change who he is. The most, you know, no matter who he's talking to, he's going to give the Bernie message. And if he can take that message to audiences that don't hear it and sell that message, that's a big deal. And I think that is, that is why he, he does that. I, I was obviously not involved in this recent Fox News uh, debate. Frankly, I, I actually haven't seen it. I do want to watch it. I just haven't gotten around to it. But, you know, I think Bernie, Bernie is somebody who no matter what audience he's talking to is going to deliver the same message. I remember there's a moment that's not in the book where uh, Sasha Baron Cohen and one of his characters ended up interviewing Bernie in 2018. And um, the thing about it is you can go watch the interview. Sasha Baron Cohen's dress is like a crazy guy from West Virginia in a wheelchair saying crazy things to Bernie. Um, Bernie had no idea who it was. It, that was in and of itself a whole incident. Um, but Bernie's interview, he just says what, you know, he talks about uh, economic rights. He talks about pay. He, he doesn't change. Other people who were caught in that Sasha Baron Cohen moment said crazy things, tried to pander. That's not Bernie. He's going to deliver his message regardless of who he's talking to. And I think that's, that's actually his strength is people know wherever he's talking, he's going to say the thing that matters, the thing that he believes. Thank you. Um, what's the secret to his in amazing energy? Uh, genetics. I mean, I, I honestly, I'm amazed. Look, when I left his office last July, I, I went and talked to him in May and said, I have to, and I said, look, the reason I can't do this anymore is I can't, I'm 43 and I can't keep up with you. I do, I do a lot of things in the world. Like one of the things I do is I, I, I like photographing large sharks. I can swim with sharks and I can't keep up with Bernie. I, and it's absolutely true. The man, the man has a level of energy at 80 years old that is absolutely insane. I, I hope we can all have his genetics because it, it, it is literally one of the most unbelievable things. And what there's a story I tell in the book, we were in Iowa campaigning for this congressional candidate, J.D. Schlotten. And they wanted to film a video of J.D., Bernie, and the Secretary of State candidate at the time, Deborah DeGier, playing horse on a basketball court. Now, I think Deborah had played somewhere basketball. J.D. was a professional baseball player, like in the minor leagues, but still a professional athlete. And they're both like, 30 to 40 years younger than Bernie. And Bernie, after he gets off the court, is disappointed in his performance versus a professional athlete who is 35 to 40 years younger than him. And, and just like, and, you know, he is an athlete. And, and maybe that's part of it. You know, he was a runner in high school. I don't think people realize this. He's a fairly athletic person. And he likes being physically active. He liked going always on the campaign, if he could go for a walk, if he could be outside, if he could not be cooped up or sitting down, he'd want to be outside walking. And that's probably part of his health. Thank you. Um, what is maybe uh, one of some of the most interesting things that didn't make it into the book? That's a good question. Um, so the original draft was about double the length of the book um, and just had a lot more stuff that I just didn't think was, I didn't think was, didn't fit who was Bernie, was more gossipy, was more something that like, I didn't think was additive, didn't add to the narrative. I, I think most of the interesting stuff made it into the book. I would say, you know, little things like, you know, we're in O'Hare airport and Bernie was like, maybe I should like have a conversation. Like he had never spoken to Jeremy Corbyn. He's like, maybe we should have a, can you call and see if we could set up a call? 
I had a number that I was given to reach Jeremy Corbyn if Bernie wanted to reach him. I called the number and like, I get, hi, this is Jeremy. Wait, uh, Corbyn? Uh, and it was him and I just handed Bernie my cell and they had a conversation. Like little things like that, but they, I took them out because it just, it's you know a fun story, but it doesn't fit the narrative of the book. It doesn't really add anything. What's next for you? Um, I am primarily, uh, I've been promoting this book. I have been uh, doing a lot of work outside the United States um, and just kind of, you know, seeing, trying, I, I literally spent three or four years not stopping. So I've been trying to slow down and like take a rest for a little bit. Also taking photos of sharks has been a major Oh, taking a break and taking photographs of sharks sounds great. Yes. Um, well, Ari, thank you so much. This has been a real delight. Uh, this thank has been Ari Ibn Uh The book is The Fighting uh, the Fighting Soul. You can order it here from Northshire.com. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We'll see you at another Northshire Live soon. Thanks very much. Bye. Good night, everyone.